Hi, we're back with another retro boat video. First, I have a question for you. What production boat was made from 1997 to 2003? Only 16 were made, yet the boat has legendary status. It's almost cultish, the popularity of a boat that they only built 16 of them. Do you think you know what it is? One, two, three, listen. And here it is, the J125. This is hole number 11. I believe it was made in 1999, not 100% sure. Guy up in Dana Point bought it, Vigo Torbenson, renamed it Time Shaver, brought, bought it in Cowes in London, England, and then brought the thing over here. It's now called Nareen, as you can see. A guy named Standish Fleming owns it in San Diego. And what a gem of a boat it is. Why? It's an all carbon boat. I mean all carbon boat. It's actually, this, the sophistication on the build on this boat belies the plainness of how the boat actually looks. It's triple vacuum bagged. They bag the outer skin, they bagged the core, the foam core, and they bagged the inner skin. Outer skin is Kevlar, inner skin is carbon. Deck built the same way. So as a result, the boat is light. Like how light? 41 feet long. It weighs 8,300 pounds. That is light with a monster, monster prod that will show you how far it goes and huge asymmetrical spinnakers. The boat is only 10 and a half feet wide. Tons of water line, super light, and guess what? Just like some of our other boats that we did, Santa Cruz 50, More 24, this is a surfing boat. And that is part of its legendary status. The J125 is almost exclusively a West Coast boat because it's kind of designed for West Coast sailing. A lot of downwind work here. It's what we do in Southern California. We like to go south and get some breeze. So back before COVID, there was Cabo Race, there was Manzanillo Race, Puerto Vallarta Race, of course, the various Ensenada races. But the big kahuna for this boat is Transpac. And these boats have one Transpac. I don't have the stats. Just that's what you have Google for. The boats win Transpac. They sail super light. And the boats are really, really quick. And because they are relatively simple, they're relatively easy to sail. Start off at the Helmsman station here. Remember our last video, Blue Blaze is the Reichel Pew 50. And remember the complexity back here where the boat had masthead runners, sort of normal runners at the, uh, at the middle spreaders, and then check stays as well. All three of those all tied in together so that when you ease one, you ease them all. Still, three sets of backstays. If you, and then if you count the permanent backstay, which they hardly use. This boat's very, very simple from that. Just a regular permanent backstay, not so regular necessarily, uh, hydraulically controlled. And then this boat only has check stays. So if you follow these up, you'll see that they attach right up there. You could call those runners, but typically runners would go further up. And they only use this for mass control, so it won't overband and to provide some support for the giant kites that you fly. And you know, it's a little bit of a pain for the owner to be back here and he hits you in the head, or the helmsman, but the helmsman has, this is the helmsman's delight. Beautifully sized wheel, I mean, typically, I would probably want to have a tiller on this boat, but since most all these boats came with wheels, I believe they almost all did. This is a pretty nice way to go. You know, again, if I, one of the things I always look at when I'm on any boat is what do I, what's in front of me on the boat? Like what's in my way other than people standing up? Well, this boat, there's not much. I mean, it's a clear shot. You've got a lot of places you can steer from. If it's really windy downwind, you know, you can be here super light air, you know, you're kind of doing something a little more subtle. You can access the rudder post. So if the wheel breaks, you can put a tiller on it and steer with a tiller. And then this boat oh, actually has a bracket for an emergency rudder, which you have to have if you're racing to Hawaii. You need to have some capability that if the main rudder fails, you have to have a reasonable backup rudder, emergency rudder, as they say. And so whatever they have fits in that bracket, they store it down below and so they're, they're covered almost no matter what breaks. Steering wise, they're covered here and you hope that nothing breaks, obviously. 
We'll move a little bit forward in the boat. Outside of the ginormous asymmetricals, the mainsail is the biggest sail on the boat. I mean, it's got a long boom, super tall P, and so you need to have some controls on the thing, and here you go. The main sheet is split, so each side has its own winch. The mainsail trimmer can, eat, can sit right here, or he can sit forward. You'll notice that it's got a nice place for the feet. The helmsman can also sit here too if he wants to kind of get his weight forward and have a nice place to rest his feet. If not, the main sheet trimmer can sit here or he can sit here. Either way, it's all right here. He's communicating with the helmsman, which is always a delight as opposed to having it forward where you just, you need to talk to the helmsman and vice versa all the time. Sometimes a mainsail trimmer doesn't really know what you need in terms of how much helm you have, how much helm you don't have. And so it's a great communication center here. Since the boat only has a single hydraulic backstay, here's the panel for it. Traveler controls are here, and that is the mainsail trim system. And really, what else do you need? I mean, this is all it right here. If we go a little further forward on the boat, again, lending to the simplicity of the design, the cockpit is huge, it's open, it's uncomplicated. Plenty of room for trimmers, the pit person has plenty of room there, and there's room for people to run in and out depending on what's needed here. But just again, the openness and the simplicity of the cockpit on this boat is fabulous. Here's something interesting. Outside of the two main sheet winches, this boat only has four winches in total. Two primaries, two halyard winches, which also get used to trim the spinnaker depending upon angles and where people are and that kind of stuff. So nothing uh, like, like a lot of J-boats. Very simple, relatively easy to use and work. This boat with so much sail area, being as narrow as it is, you know, this boat is a sensitive boat and you need good sailors on this boat. The Hamachi crew was top flight. All the J125s that do well, and there are a number of them here in Southern California. They've got really good people on the boat and just like any boat, you do need good sailors to make it go, but what a great place to do your business right in here. I don't mean that business, I mean the sailing business. Pretty damn nice. One thing you may have noticed uh, or not noticed is the fact that there's hardly any pad eyes on this boat. Typical pad eyes, you know, they get bolted through the deck, through bolted, attached blocks there, whatever it might be. This boat ha doesn't have those. It has a thing called a rope eye, which is right here and right here. So the idea here is you don't have the weight and the bulk and sort of the ugliness of pad eyes everywhere. It goes down below and it's in its own device down below. It gets the weight a little lower, cleans up the deck. So those are rope eyes and they're very, very slick and they're not really all that cheap either. But the boat's got them and it adds to the clean look of the boat. Really nice touch. We're here at the mid deck of the J125. Nothing really remarkable here, nor should there be. I mean, again, simplified is how this boat rolls. Uh, adjustable jib leads, the halyards obviously come back, a nice set of billboards. One thing this boat has, and probably every serious racing boat in San Diego with a pretty vertical keel, kelp cutter. A lot of people don't know what's the kelp cutter. So this is it right here, you grab it here, it runs through the bottom of the boat all the way down to the bottom of the keel. I think this boat draws almost eight feet. That's a pretty long piece of material. And what they do to put a kelp cutter in a boat is they'll cut a groove out of the leading edge of the keel that's just large enough to put a really strong, like a G10 tube down there. And then at the bottom of it, you've got a titanium razor blade that sticks out. So the rod is in the leading edge of the keel, but, the, but the, uh, the blade sticks out. So if you think you have kelp, and you'll know, you'll slow down or you'll feel it right away. Could also be on the rudder, but you always start with the keel first. So somebody comes up, grabs this, pulls the thing up, and then shoves it back down, and that generally will cut it off. Most of you don't need it. Most of you have no idea why, but here in San Diego, it is kelp city, and both inside the bay and outside of the ocean, you gotta have a kelp cutter on a boat like this. On Anarchy 5, my Ericsson 35, not so much. It's got a really radical sweep to the uh, keel, so nothing sticks to it, at least I hope. Four deck of the J125. Not a lot going on up here, and thank Jesus for that. Uh, you're gonna have enough going on when you're flying giant ASOs off this 
giant sprint, which we'll show. But otherwise, there's a couple of tack locations, probably for the stay sail uh, or stay sails that they use. They probably fly a double head rig, I think, and certainly have a spinnaker stay sail. So here's the retractable sprit on the boat. Frankly, it's a little shorter than I would have thought. I, I'm a freak when it comes to asymmetrical spinnakers and long sprits that stick out there. I'd probably like uh, three more feet on this thing, but the boat actually doesn't really need it, certainly not in a breeze. Light air probably pretty nice, but this is one thing I just love on boats, retractable sprits. You see a lot of new modern boats, the new Moore 33, for example. You can go to sailinganarchy.com and you can find a picture and a description of the Moore 33. They've got a fixed sprit. That is, it just it bolts on here, it's supported down low, and it's permanent, and it sticks out I'm guessing about this long. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want a boat where I have to sail around with a sprit out there all the time. Docking, you gotta, you gotta be in a longer slip. Uh, start line maneuvers, you, suddenly, you have to realize that your boat actually extends another 10 feet beyond where you think it is. Uh, mark maneuvers, port starboards, ay yeah, yeah. I don't like that, so sprit out when the kite's up, sprit in when it's not, easy. Well, if you're expecting luxury down below at J125, you'll be sorely disappointed. If you're a full hardcore racer, which you pretty much would be, if you buy one of these, you're overjoyed. I mean, this is very, very simple. One of the things you'll notice right away is the main salon, such as it is, is not very goddamn big. I mean, from the ladder to the main bulkhead, what is that? Maybe six feet? So there's not a lot there. But that's what happens when you build a ginormous cockpit into a boat, right? You can't have a big cockpit and a big down below unless you run the cabin house all the way, way forward. Nobody wants to do that. So big cockpit is worth it because you're spending 90% of your time, maybe more than that, out there on deck. Down below here, it's just pure efficiency. You have the set T bunks with the lee cloth so you, somebody can sleep here. If we look aft, you'll see that the boat has two sets of pipe berths on either side. So basically, let's say you're doing transpac, let's say you're sailing with six people, which would be, I think it'd be about right. Three people can put their weight exactly where it needs to be, right? If it's really honking, you need weight aft, everybody's there. The wind's a little lighter, you know, two people can be here and it's not unheard of to sleep on the floor here on some sails. I've done it way more than I, I care to remember. The boat has a little bit of a galley here, molded in sink, that's kind of nice. This boat races a lot offshore, at least it certainly did under Vigo. Uh, they did a ton of Mexican races, did really well. So the boat, as you can see, is just chock full of safety gear. I mean, it's got stuff everywhere. If I, I looked under here, there's things everywhere. And carrying all this safety gear is one of the problems with having a really small boat because you have to carry essentially the same stuff as the big boats. Maybe not in, in terms of numbers, but still. So you gotta find places to put all this stuff. And on a boat like this, it's not necessarily that easy. The other thing you're probably wondering, and I was wondering too, is I would have thought maybe an ice box would have been here. Nope, on this boat, you bring an ice chest or a couple of them. And if you're gonna do a long distance race, Cabo, you know, it's dry ice for the stuff that you, you know, is perishable. And the rest of it's all space food. So here we are at the nav station with a cute little chart table right here. Keep, keep all your tools there, some of them. Cute little carbon fiber drawer. I mean, it's really nice little touches and it's, it all looks really great. If, assume, assuming you like black and white, which I do. Um, this is where it all happens. This is where the, you know, they do all of their chart plotting right here on this. Um, here's a little interesting thing. So they've got a little speed chart here, right? So let's go to the, let's go right to the most wind. So true wind speed is 20 knots. The apparent, uh, true wind angle is 142 and the average boat speed is 13.7. Yeah, in flat water. But I guarantee in 20 true at 142 uh, wind true wind angle, you are not doing 13.7. It's probably more like close to tw in the 20s, uh, for sure. It's one of the delights about this boat. It is so light, it is so narrow, and it's just designed to go downwind. Fuller bow sections, so the thing doesn't dig in. But, so in terms of the, the brain trust down below, he lives right here. Yeah, not the most comfortable, right? There's no chair to sit in. You're not 
facing a certain way. Um, but that's just the way this boat is. Come on up forward. Yes, I'm sitting on the head in the J125. This is where one would do this sort of business on this boat. It's open, it's wide. You've got a semi hanging locker there, which nobody uses because you can't bring on board stuff that goes in the hanging locker unless it's your foul weather gear. So this is just a place where you do this, uh, the mast comes through obviously enough to a very simple mast step. It's all built up, very solid. I don't know what actually is in there, but it's really, really solid. So that you don't push the mast through the bottom of the boat. Uh, these are all the sails where everything goes when you're sitting at the dock. When you're racing, they're all out. And a boat like this carries probably eight to ten sails, I would think. Most of them being of the spinnaker variety, all different size ASOs and different materials and different cuts. Couple jibs, a storm jib, stay sail, and that pretty much is what you have on the boat. Easy, easy, easy. So that's our retro boat of the J125. A pretty impressive thing, you have to admit. Good looking, fast as hell, very limited. As I said, only 16 built. Wow. Fully carbon fiber, fully bagged. I like it. If you like this video, just click the like button down there. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, and there's a button for that as well. For Nobleman Productions, for Sailing Anarchy, I'm Scott Tempesta. We're out.